I remind you this morning that we are continuing in the closing words of the Lord Jesus Christ to His disciples before He goes to the cross. These disciples will be frightened and scattered. They could not begin to understand, even though Christ had told them what was going to take place. They were going to be terribly troubled. Christ would be crucified, and they would be living in fear. Christ was trying to prepare them or preparing them to understand that they would continue the ministry in His absence. And the words that He is speaking to them on this occasion are most significant, and they are significant to us as well, because we are the extension and the the blessed recipients of the works of the disciples that have gone before us. We have a great cloud of witnesses, as the writer of Hebrews tells us. And so we are to be like them, laying aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily besets us, and looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We are to be about His business. People ask, that's one of the questions that you see the most, what is the will of God for my life? My friend, here is the will of God for your life. If you're a Christian, uh, the same things that Christ is telling His disciples are true for you and me today because the world has not changed. The world in this context of which we've read this morning is not the mountains and trees, and people often get that confused. What do you mean the world hates you? It's talking about the system of evil. It's talking about, as the Bible describes, the the, the prince of this world, the God of this world, who is leading the hordes of evil demons and spirits that are in opposition to God and are seeking to destroy the testimony of God. John calls the, uh, him in his epistle at the, uh, stating that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. He is powerful, and he is behind the troubles of this world and the problems that are given especially to God's people because of Jesus Christ, as we shall see. Uh, With that, and we're going to be looking this morning, continuing uh, hopefully to the end of uh, chapter 15, beginning in verse 21, and something of of a little bit of a summation of, of Christ admonition and commands to his disciples and there is much here for us as well once again bow with me please as we ask God to intervene on our behalf Holy Father we we just know that we need your word applied to our heart we need to to take our mind away from the mundane things that we easily get involved in and to recognize our calling this morning as your children. May we take the same words that Christ spoke to his disciples 2,000 years ago and apply them by your Spirit to our hearts today. Father, that we would be found faithful to you. Please help me speak your word. Help me to articulate things that that would make them clear and understandable, Father, and not violate that which is truly said here. We praise you that you are with us, and we know that without you we can do nothing. Please bless our time, bless every person here, and use this time for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. As a young man, growing up in the 60s, and I graduated from high school in the mid-60s, some of you might find that rather troubling that anybody could be that old, I don't know. But some of the rest of you may think, well, that's still a youngster, I don't know, because we have all ages in here. But as a young man growing up in the 60s, I grew up under the shadow of the Vietnam War. And of course, you know that at that time there was something called the draft, 
And that meant that when I ran out of exemptions, as well all the other young men, that if I was able-bodied and, you know, amazingly enough, there was nothing physically wrong with me, that I was going to be called into service and probably shipped out across the ocean to the other side of the world and there be engaged in a world of fighting in the jungles of Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, with unclear goals, controversy, and death. I knew by this because I had friends that went and they came back with horrid stories. They came back different people. I also had friends that came back in body bags. There were 58,000 young men that were killed from the United States of America in that tough and controversial war, a war in which there was an uncertainty of the cause and the purpose. Some of us believed strongly that they were not really trying to win the war, and we couldn't understand that. And it seemed like the young people that were going there were giving their lives in that sense for a lost cause. Well, I did run out of my exemptions. And I want to make it clear that I'm not complaining about that. Um, I've always been very patriotic, and I've always been very thankful for those that are in the service. And I was to be drafted, and here I go. And I ended up, though, by the grace of God, in the Army Guard, in a reserve unit, and although I was under the shadow of being called up and I thought we were going to go any time, I was never called to go to Vietnam. I thank the Lord for that to this day. But I recognize many did, and all of that is in the sovereignty of God as well. And they were called into a battle, into a, a place that there was death, there was despair, there was trouble, and I think the worst thing about it was the fact that the cause was not clear. The purpose was not clear. Certainly not even in the minds of the soldiers that were there because I went through the same training that they did. I was right there with them and I know what their attitude was. And they were very despondent by and large, feeling like they were being used basically as cannon fodder. But let me tell you about another battle. A Christian has been called to a very certain battle. The values, the purpose, the justice, the goals, the reasons are complete and perfect and clear and even glorious. And the cause is the greatest cause of all. Here was a battle that we can physically see for our great nation. And there's patriotic young men that have given their lives. And that's a wonderful thing. But as compared to this other cause, this other battle, all other battles are far less even than that. Christ is calling His disciples here in this context to a, ba a battle. And he has told them what to do. If you look at verse 16 of John 15, he says, You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name he may give you. You are to go in my power, leaning upon me, asking of me, and enter the battle. You have been appointed to bear much fruit in this battle. But in the midst of that battle, he has warned his own about persecution, hasn't he? This is not an easy battle as any battle is not easy. And certainly the greatest battle is going to be a difficult one. And so beginning in verse 21... 
he, we continue on, he says, But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. The but here connects back to the preceding words of Christ. What things is he referring to? These things that they will do to you. Look back at verse 18. The world hates you. You know it's hated me before it hated you. Hating you. Verse 20. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And he gives the stimulus for this, which is a very peculiar one. What stirs up this hatred? What stirs up this, these acts of persecution? He says in verse 21, for my name's sake. Or we would take that as an equivalent to because of me. Or it could be stated, for my sake, or on my account. The idea is that Christ's name is equal to himself or his person as though he were still physically here. Now why is Christ's name so important today? You could name somebody else's name and not cause any ire. It's because he's real. Because he's alive. Because he is contradictory to the natural man. Men love darkness rather than light. Men will not have God to rule over them. And Christ is God. When I was in the service, in my advanced training, uh, I was trucked over with a bunch of other guys to Monterey, California. And we marched in a Memorial Day parade there. And this was back again in 1970, and the Kent State Affair had just occurred where the National Guard had killed a bunch of students that were protesting the war. There was anger throughout the United States. And as I was marching in that parade, rocks, even bottles, curses were thrown at me and the other soldiers that were marching in that parade. Now, I knew that their anger was not at me personally. They didn't even know me. But their anger, their antagonism, was against what the United States was doing, and that was the controversy surrounding that rather ugly war. This Wednesday night at our prayer meeting, Tom talked about one of the, I think, better religious broadcasters and evangelists that's on TV, Michael Yusuf, who, an Egyptian-born minister, uh, was invited to do a prayer at some kind of a Washington, D.C. function. And uh, there were a bunch of, of representatives and senators and dignitaries there. And he prayed just like he would any other time, and he exalted the name of Christ. He's the Alpha and the Omega, he said. And when he got to the end, he prayed in Jesus' name, and he said when he got through, there were people that were literally shooting bullets at him with their eyes because he was supposed to give some kind of a generic prayer. He wasn't supposed to mention the name of Christ. You see, at the name of Christ, anger, hate, bitterness comes out of individuals because they don't want to face the true and the living God. It's not personal. It's our association with Christ that this world system despises. And that's why in verse 29 they will do to you for my name's sake. And then notice what he says, verse 21, the second part, because they do not know the one who sent me. They do not know the one who sent me. That little word know there, we've looked at the word know in the context of prognosco, which, which is absolute relationship knowledge. But this little word know is oida, which means to appreciate or understand. It is a different word for know than we, we commonly think of. For example, in John 10, 27, when Christ says, uh, My sheep hear my voice and I know them, that's a relationship know. But here, 
It is a knowing of understanding and a knowing of even appreciation that they do not know God. They don't really know Him at all. Now, Christ was in the context of talking to His disciples who were dealing with religious people. The most religious people on the face of the earth were these Jews. And they claimed to know God. If we go back, in fact, let's do that. Eight, chapter 8. Look at verse 41. Christ is speaking to these same ones. Verse 41 of chapter 8, You're doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, We were not born of fornication. In other words, that was a slam to Christ. Of course, he wasn't either. But he says, We have one father, God. And notice what Christ said down in verse 47. He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. They had no appreciation for the truth of God. They had no ability to hear it. And that's what Christ was stating of them. They don't really know God at all, even though they claim to know God. The real God, the true God, is meaningless to them. And of course this fits with the natural ingratitude of man in Romans chapter 1 again, when it says that when they knew God, and that means they should have known God, He was apparent to them by everything that was made, by all that He has done. They didn't honor Him as God, neither were they thankful. They didn't appreciate Him. Same kind of concept. Something that you and I as Christians must constantly be aware that the world is not a friend of grace. And so here you are, zealous for the things of God, and you're going around as a, as a bee buzzing with the truth of God, desirous of living that out, and here's all of these people that do not appreciate or want to hear about it at all. That's the world we live in. In fact, Romans 3 says, there's no fear of God before their eyes. Now, what do, you, what do you do with this? Well, first of all, just as a thought here, we can kind of go two directions. We can be angry about that, mad at the world, as it were. And I've caught myself in that a few times. But I've also caught myself, and sometimes it's been overwhelming to me, looking at people. I can recall one time when I was on jury duty, I was downtown, just sitting on the sidewalk at the break watching people go by and, and just thinking how terrible it is that the masses of people in this world are lost and they need Christ, they need truth, they need enlightenment. Do you ever feel sorry for those that are caught in this no win, no possibility situation? Somebody brought the truth to you, didn't they? And these people need truth. It doesn't mean they're going to necessarily respond to it. But they might. Because God is calling a people out of darkness into marvelous light. But these individuals that are hardened have, have no ability to appreciate or understand and naturally have no respect for God. And because of that, they're not going to like you and me if we're carrying the name of Christ. They're not going to appreciate what we're doing. They're not going to enjoy it. They're not going to like it. They're not going to even tolerate it. Because they do not know the one who sent me, says Christ. And he says in verse 22, back in 15, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Now, what Christ is talking about here is not that men don't have sin. Let's not take something out of the, the context in which it is found that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. He's addressing a particular degree of sin. They have personally rejected the supreme revelation of Jesus Christ. Here was Christ 
whom God the Father had said, This is my beloved Son, hear Him, who had walked about on the earth doing things that no one else could do, speaking in a way that no one else could possibly speak, and yet He was rejected. Look back with me, please, at Matthew chapter 11. Probably one of the most incredible places of evil, which unfortunately I think the America has, is becoming daily. Here is Christ speaking in verse 20 of Matthew 11. He began to denounce the cities in which most of His miracles were, were done because they did not repent. They had the truth. They had the revelation of God. In Christ Jesus, He says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, evil, wicked, Tyre and Sidon, probably the pits as far as darkness and wickedness are, are concerned, He says, If the miracles had occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And He says, Nevertheless, I say to you, it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Here is a degree of judgment that comes from the lips of Christ based on our degree of enlightenment, as it were. There is an accountability factor that is here. And as we deal with things today in our own world of Christendom, and most of us that are sitting here today have heard the truth over and over and over again. Many of us from the time that we were a child, when we could first hear, we were hearing about the things of God. There is an accountability factor. Look with me please in the book, in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 12. We looked here last week and I, I remind you of that in this parable. In Luke chapter 12 of readiness, if you look at verse 35, Christ gives this parable, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Readiness is about His business, and keeping your lamps lit is to be fervent in spirit, walking in the light. Be like men who are waiting for their Master when He returns. Is that where we are today? You better believe it. Is Christ going to return? Yes, in an hour when you think not. And he goes on to say in verse 37, Blessed are those slaves whom the Master will find only alert when He comes. But he goes on to talk about some down here. Look at verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and sensible steward when His Master will put in charge of His servants to give them the rations at the proper time? Now he's not talking there. He's talking literally giving the picture of a Master turning over uh, His estate to his slaves that they might tend the people that work there and the workers and care for them and so forth. He's talking in physical terms, but he's really speaking in, in spiritual terms. What are you and I supposed to be about as bond servants of Jesus Christ? We're supposed to be feeding those that come into our frame of reference. Feeding them with the truth of God. If you look down in verse 45, he talks about the slave that says in his heart, My master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. In other words, instead of doing what he's supposed to be doing, he abuses the opportunity, he abuses the blessing of the responsibility that he has, and he mistreats these individuals that he should be giving the blessing and the truth of God to, and He abuses them. Now, we can abuse people in the worst manner conceivable when we don't tell them the truth of Christ. I'm afraid somebody may stand someday and point their finger at me in judgment and say, You didn't tell me. You didn't tell me about this Jesus. Why didn't you tell me about Him? I'm going to have to be ashamed that I didn't. That's abusing 
the slaves. And he goes on to say here, that slave, verse 47, who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. There is an accountability, don't kid yourself, before God of what we do with the privileges that He has given to us. There is the hottest hell reserved for those who have received all kinds of blessings and turned their back on those blessings and not done what God has commanded them to do. They are a soldier that is derelict of their duty. They are a wall. God has called us to battle. And we are to be in that battle. Christ says back in our passage, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Here were these religious leaders that were supposed to be representing God to the people and instead they were making them twice the son of hell as themselves. They were misleading them and even crucifying the very Lord of life that was prophesied in all of the Old Testament Scriptures. And my friend, if in our day and time we don't fight the good fight of faith, to whatever degree, I'm afraid we're guilty of the same type of sin that these religious leaders were guilty of. May I remind you of just some of the foolishness of this? Look back at John chapter 9. You remember the man born blind? I love this passage. Here's a man born blind and Christ heals him. And these Pharisees, these religious leaders, are trying to find fault in any way they can so they can accuse Christ of evil. And so they call the man for the second time. And look at verse 29, jumping in. He says, we know, here's the religious leader speaking, that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, that is Jesus, we do not know where he's from. <laughs> and the man re rebukes them. Here's this ignorant man that has been sitting around blind and begging and uh, talking to these hot-shot, educated, knowing the Scriptures supposedly Pharisees. And he says, the man answered, well, here is an amazing thing that you don't know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does His will, He hears Him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Well, how about over in John chapter 11? John chapter 11. Here was the resurrection of Lazarus. Well, you remember the account. Lazarus has been in the grave three days on purpose by Christ, sovereignly. They said, by now he stinks, his body is decaying. And Christ goes to the tomb after weeping on account of the sorrow of sin. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes forth, bound hand and foot, and he says, release him. These individuals saw that occur. Who could imagine such a thing? What a glorious day! Hallelujah! What God has done! It says in verse 45, Therefore many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what He had done believed in Him. Ah, but not all, but some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. And then what happens in verse 47 and following? They begin to convene a council and we're saying, what are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him. Wouldn't that be terrible? He raised a man from the dead. That's why Jesus is saying what he's doing, what he's saying here. In the passage before us, 
If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. My friends, we are in the same point today. As we are being commanded to be warriors, ambassadors, soldiers for the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot simply turn our back and walk away. And I'm preaching to myself as well. And do our own thing. That's why Paul says, I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. You see, who does this fit today? Well, unfortunately and sadly, it fits most churches, unfortunately, who have abandoned the truth of God, who have abandoned the cause of Christ. It was just too hard. It was too difficult. People were complaining. People didn't like us. They didn't want to hear the message. So we started watering the message down. We started diluting it. We started adding some man's philosophy to it. We started adding some entertainment and some sweet noises so that everybody would be happy. No. That's not what Christ says. And those attending church hear the truth, I trust that those that are at this church are hearing the truth. We are responsible for that. And if we hear the truth of God and it doesn't change us, these Pharisees heard the truth of God. They saw God's work firsthand and it didn't change them. They didn't repent. They didn't bow the knee. God be merciful to me, the sinner. And take up their cross and follow Christ. And you know, I'm afraid it fits much of America. Because in America, there's many opportunities to hear and find the truth, even today. If somebody's trying to find the truth and they're really desirous of knowing what it's all about. It can be found. But if we turn our back upon that truth, God says we are in great peril. We are accountable. Now, you'll also notice here in verse 23, it says, they have no, well, verse 22, they have no excuse for their sin. God will hold us accountable. And He says, He who hates me, verse 23, hates my Father also. The Jews thought they could claim God as their Father and at the same time despise and reject Christ. And today, I've talked to individuals myself that says, Well, you know, I love God, but I don't go to church. I'm not really... What they're saying is, is I'm not concerned about the things. Well, do you ever read your Bible? Well, you know, every once in a while I get it out and dust it off. But, you know, I'm not really concerned about that. I've got too many other things going on right now. Is that what you call a soldier of the cross? A follower of the Lamb? Oh, my friends. You see, such an attitude is impossible. We cannot say that I love God if we're not honoring Jesus Christ. And how do we honor Jesus Christ? We must do what He says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you to do? He that will not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me, he says. And so what he's saying here, verse 23, who hates me hates my father also. They're not... They're, Interconnected. Remember John 10, 30? I and the Father are one. You can't separate the two out. Who, who did Christ obey in everything that He did? I didn't come to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. Who sent Christ? God sent Christ. He is the only Savior. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are to follow Him. He is the Master. He is the express image of the Father, says Hebrews 1.3. To dislike Christ, to dishonor Him, to not listen to Him, to disregard Him, to disobey Him, to turn our back upon Him, is to hate Him, to despise Him, 
to reject Him. And you know, the world opposition continues to revolve around the identity of Christ. Just as I stated about Michael Yusuf. And it will today. You know, you, you, in fact, people don't mind talking about Christ as some kind of a good teacher and a, a fine fellow man that made an impact on some f fanatics a long time ago and maybe on you today. But not as God. <laughs> not as the one I have to bow the knee before. Not as the one who must control and dictate the demands of my life, the commands that I am to obey. But here it says God will hold all accountable according to what a person does with Christ. Down in verse 25, he says, but if they had done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law, and that is, here he's quoting Psalm 69, they hated me without a cause. And that little word hate in the Greek means gift. I won't take the time to go there, but in Ephesians 3, 7, that word is used in the context of salvation. Salvation is the gift of God, not of works. If we receive a gift, it means it's without merit. It's not something that we earned. And here they're, he's saying in the reverse, they hated Christ without merit. There was no reason to hate Christ. There was no basis for hating Him. This is pure injustice. God is our Creator. God is our owner. He has the right of the potter over the clay, and we are the clay. So what can we attribute this hatred? Well, may I say again that the biggest issue that the church neglects and disregards is the issue of sin in man's heart. Theologians call it the total depravity of man. not understanding the natural condition because of the fall in which we all find ourselves unless God works in our heart and changes us into a new creation. We are found in that same condition and the same hatred, the same despising of loving darkness rather than light that placed Christ on the cross under the sovereignty of God murdering the Creator, while at the same time we see God's glory. In using that hatred of man to bring salvation, that alone should always make us marvel. God is glorious while man is accountable. But notice as we get down to Verse 26, he says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. Here's the vindicators of God. God didn't just leave it with that, with the rejection. He went to be at the right hand of God the Father, and he left the cause of Christ in these disciples' hands, these disciples who were weak and scared and, and always seemed to be confused and always getting everything wrong. And yet, Christ is leaving it in their hands, but He's doing something special, He says here, of course. He will send them the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He is God Himself, and He becomes the vindicator that will work in them, will guide them, in fact, it says that if you look forward in verse 16, verse 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. And He will also convict the world. Verse 8, And He, when He comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And those are the two things that make the absolute difference. Here are these floundering disciples and we could put ourselves right here. These floundering individuals, scared, weak, 
fumbling and bumbling and troubling and all the other things that go with us. But here's the Holy Spirit. He will work in us, through us, and He will convict the world. He will convict those whom God wants to be convicted. Because the Holy Spirit is God, purposely sent, the very power and ability we need. In fact, He will, Christ will say later, of course, that that uh, it, it is to their advantage that He goes away, that this Spirit will come. And so here is this Spirit coming to testify, and notice what He testifies of. He will testify about me. The whole purpose and the focus of everything is upon the King of Kings, Jesus Christ Himself. Even God's focus is upon Christ and glorification of His name. That's why Paul would say, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But he doesn't stop there because he says in verse 27, and you will testify also. And you, you floundering bunch of people, the disciples, will testify also. Now there is no will in fact, yours may be in italics in your Bible. There, that has been added by the translators. It says, and you testify also. This is really a command. God has given the command, and it extends to us. He will give the great commission later after His resurrection. What are we to be about? Paul writes that we are to be ambassadors. We, we studied in Sunday school this morning that even in the prison place, they were heralding the things of God. They were focused upon Jesus Christ. They were determined to be good soldiers of the cross. Be a witness, bear record, report. That's what testify means. Despite the opposition, the hate, even the persecution which he has warned, you must do it. You are obligated. You are commanded, in other words. Soon Peter... The strongest one among them will do what? Denounce him three times. But yet on the day of Pentecost, in fact, turn there, Acts chapter 2. There's no denouncing by Peter then. Here is Peter preaching one of those sermons that would just, you could fry eggs on that sermon. I mean, it, it was a scorcher. He didn't hold back anything. And it was all about Christ and what He had done and how they had crucified the Lord of life. You nailed Him to a cross. And it says in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. What's happening there? The Holy Spirit's convicting, isn't He? Just like Christ said. What was Peter's responsibility? Preach the word. Doesn't mean that everybody's going to get convicted. They did there. Didn't they? And they cried out, What shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There it is. There is nothing as important as that. That is the battle lines that are drawn. And it wasn't just for Peter. It is for us today. And he goes on to say, back in our text, he says, And you testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. They had been eyewitnesses of His majesty. As Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Or in the beginning of the Gospel of John in chapter 1 and verse 14 where John talks about we beheld His glory. Glory of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Well, my friend, have we not seen the glory of Christ? Have you seen the glory of Christ? You children, some of you that have 
You're, you're still wondering, should I know, do I know Christ or do I not know Christ? I haven't made a commitment to Him. I haven't really asked Him to be my Lord and my Savior and my Master. Maybe you're thinking, Mommy and Daddy will take care of that. I'm not trying to frighten you, but those are, you have heard the word of truth. You have received it ever since you can hear and remember. And you need to be thinking in terms of what will I do with Christ? You see, you have received many blessings. You have received many opportunities. There are people in this world that I, I'm assuming that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. But you have. And you've heard the truth from His Word over and over again. What are you going to do with it? Paul says that I'm not ashamed of the Gospel. I will admit to you that there have been times, too many times, that I have been ashamed of the Gospel. I've had frozen mouth and locked jaw. Because I was embarrassed to name the name of Christ. Oh, how evil that is to receive so much, to have someone in front of you that needs to hear the truth and to close our mouth and say, oh, what's the use? They don't want to hear it anyway. If God gives the opportunity, we are to be soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you know what God will do in their heart? Whether He will convict them of that or not. Whether you will plant a seed. Our responsibility above everything else, above our job, above our family, above everything else, is to you testify of me. You testify of me. Now, so far in conclusion, Christ has told them three things basically here. And again, these are very special because they are the closing words of Christ to His own. He's told them to abide in Him. We see that in 15.4. Derive their strength, the source of their ability, all from Him, walking in His light, prayerfully, trusting Him. He's told them to love one another in contrast to the world which will hate them. and The world even that is hating one another because they're trying to climb to the top of the heap. And he says in verse 27 to testify of me. Abide, love, and testify. All three are unnatural and hard and against our original fallen nature. All three require the strength of God. All three require us to abide in Him. All three require His strength, His ability. All three require obedience to Him. And all of these are in contrast to the hating world. And the last thing the world wants is to abide in Christ, to love God's people, or testify of Christ, even hear about Him. And that's why our calling is so great. Who else is going to do it? Oh, I know, as Christ said, you can make the rocks cry out, but He's given us that privilege. We are ambassadors of Christ. In closing, look with me at Acts chapter 4. Again, the account of these same floundering apostles. Look at verse chapter 4 and verse 1. Here's Peter and John arrested for preaching Christ. And it says, As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And then down in verse 5 it says, On the next day they, they capture them and, and, and put them in stocks. And on the next day the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. Here's all the big shots, the same individuals who murdered Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And because of that, 
Peter and John decided they wouldn't speak in the name of Christ. No. Look down at verse 10. Here they are talking in front of these same people. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by his, this name, this man stands before you in good health. The man that they healed through the through power of Christ. He, Christ, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's power. And that's what we need today. Instead of cowardice, we need to proclaim the name of Christ. What do you do with Jesus? Jesus. I hope that you are obedient in testifying concerning Him. I'm going to just read the words real quickly and I'll close in prayer. Of that hymn again, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? Listen to this. Am I a Soldier of the Cross? This, this hymn has always been convicting to me. A follower of the Lamb, and shall I fear to own His cause or blush to speak His name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend of grace to help me on to God? Sure I must fight if I would reign. I increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain. Supported by thy word. God help us be pleasing to Him, to testify, be His vindicators, be light in the earth where we live. Father, I pray Thee that You would use these words of Christ that were aimed at His disciples, but yet aimed at us as well as His disciples today, to convict us of our role in the world. Give us wisdom, Father, and give us strength. And help us to be about your business. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and kindness to us and for the privileges that we have. We praise you in Jesus' name.